Today we're going to talk about make, uh, those who make opinions. And there's some who have opinions, right, that we could care less if you shared them with us, to be honest, all right? There are some of us who have opinions that are political, uh, they're spiritual, they're financial. Opinions are everywhere. We're going to talk today about uh, uh, opinions you and I make. And opinionated people, uh, you're, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna relate to this really well. And those who didn't know whether to raise your hand or not, you're going to see where you fit in also. We all got opinions about what we believe on certain subjects. And this is part one of a series called Answering Life's Most Critical Questions. It's not life's toughest questions. It's not life's most important. They're just critical. And they're critical to you if you're a believer in Christ or if you desire to follow Jesus. They're critical to get answered. And today's is, how long will you waver? In about 20 minutes, you're going to be uh, asked to make a decision. You're going to be asked to, uh, to uh, side on one side or the other. And you'll see how this plays out. I just pray that God will speak today and that you'll be moved and uh, this church, this community, and this world will be transformed because we decided today, right here, right now, uh, enough's enough. I'm all in, okay? So that's where we're at today. So if you ain't ready for the ride, uh, hang on. Buckle up while I pray. Bow your heads, close your eyes, let's pray. Father, this is yours. I'm excited. I'm thrilled. I'm convinced, God. I'm convinced that you're it and, and you're all that I have ever needed. May your Holy Spirit be the teacher of the hour. May you speak to us today, God. May we be fascinated, enthralled, and convinced, God, you're all we need. So speak today. I pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Take your Bibles. 1 Kings chapter 17. I'm going to look at verse, um, uh, verses 1 through 5, and then I'm going to jump to chapter 18, and we'll be done. It, it, it won't be long. It won't be painful. Verse 1 says, now, uh, Elijah said to Ahab, let me stop right there. I'm going to work through some verses. Those of you who are um, type A, relax, I'm ADD, and type A. So can you imagine? How, how, how pressed I am to do nothing and everything at the same time. Okay, so uh, it says now, there's two people we just introduced. Now Elijah, that's the first guy I want to talk about. Those of you who've been in church for a while, you know Elijah's name, you've heard him. I've even preached from this uh, passage of scripture, different message. You need to know who Elijah is. Elijah is a prophet of God. And a prophet is called to say some tough stuff to people who don't want to hear it. And Elijah's job, is to tell the nation of Israel they're in trouble and, and God is asking him to call them back to him. And so as a prophet, you got to say some tough stuff. Uh, Elijah's perfect for the job, by the way. Elijah's name actually uh, is translated, uh, my God is Yahweh. My God is the one true God. And, and, and you're wondering, John, why are you doing all this? It's going to make sense in a little bit, so stay with me. My God is Yahweh. And it's pronounced in the Hebrew, Eliyahu, Eliyahu which is a cool name. Think about what you called your children. Why'd you name them that? If you're not going to call your child John or Eliyahu, why? Why did you mate? Okay, so, so you want to learn Hebrew today? You want to say his name? Because it's cool. But you got to do it with a little Jewish phlegm in there, okay? So uh, in a second, we're going, to have, we're going to all prepare yourself because it's group participation. Uh, we're going to say Eliyahu, okay? You get that? Eliyahu. Okay, one, two, three together. Eliyahu. Nice, nice. We all just kind of spit on the person in front of us. <laughs> so if you didn't like them, that worked out really well for you, right? Okay, good. And if you were checking her out, she don't like you no more, son. Okay, here it is. I always love how somebody says, the Lord led me to your church. No, the Lord led you to the girl in front of you. Okay, so here it is. Hey, you stalker. Okay, so stay with me. Uh, 1 Kings 17, I'm easily distracted. Verse 1 said, now uh, Elijah said to Ahab, Ahab's the king of Israel. Ahab is the king of Israel. He's the king of Israel. Don't forget this. So e Elijah, the prophet of God, is coming to the king of Israel, and he's going to lay the smack down, and this is amazing what happens. He, Elijah says, As the Lord lives, the God of Israel uh, lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. Boom! There it is. He says, Listen, dude, a a God told me to come and say to you, it will not rain, and there will be no dew for the next few years until I say so on behalf of God. I'm telling you what, I don't care how bad you are, how tough you are, you got to know who you're bringing to the fight when you step in front of a king and you tell him it ain't going to rain till I say so. And what are you going to do about it? I mean, you got to know God's with you, right? He does that. Elijah steps up. Now listen, he is prophesying that there's going to be a drought, no water, no rain. There's going to be a drought for a few years and it's a judgment because the, the children of Israel have begun to believe in other gods. They, they've stopped believing in the one true God, and remember what Elijah's name is, my God is Yahweh, the one true God. That's why he's called to do it. He knows the one true God, and the children of Israel have chosen other gods, all sorts of gods, and it makes no sense. 
Listen, God isn't in the business of sharing you with someone else. He loves you. He created you. You are his and he will fight for you. But you're going to understand this in a few moments. You got to fight for yourself. So so I've laid that down for you. And, 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 and it goes on. Verse two says, then the word of the Lord came to Elijah after he just told the king, dude, it ain't going to rain till I say so. Then the word of the Lord came to him. Verse three, leave here, turn eastward and hide. Did you catch it? God told Elijah to tell the king, it ain't going to rain till I say so. And then after he did it, then God says, dude, you need to get out of here. <laughs> I mean, you need to leave. You have ticked him off. I, I mean, I don't know. I, did you really say what I told you to say? Wow. I mean, that's what God's saying, right? Leave here and hide. <laughs> you just picked on the biggest kid on the playground, and I was messing with you. That's all I was doing, dude. I was just messing with you. So he says, leave here, turn eastward, and hide in the Careth Ravine, east of the Jordan. Verse 4, you will drink from the brook, and I, that, and I have directed the ravens to supply you with food there. Did you catch what God does? There's a drought a coming, and God's taking care of his chosen. There's a drought coming, and God's taking care of his chosen. I'm here to tell you right now that, that God wants you to know that if you're going through a drought, he will take care of you. He has reserved a brook. He has reserved a, a little bit of water so Elijah can make it through the drought. He's called upon the ravens, crows, to, to feed him with food. God can do a miraculous work with a dirty bird. It doesn't matter. God is, God is the God who can do anything at any time for anyone. I'm here to tell somebody because you've been going through a drought. It's your separation. It's the pending divorce. It's your financial crisis. It's your business relationship. It's your kids. It's your parents. There's something in your life that, that everything has been drained out. You are dry. And God wants you to know, I will take care of you. What you need to do is go in the direction God told you to go. He told Elijah, turn eastward. I wonder if you're heading west when God wanted you to go to east. I wonder where you're at today because I know my God will take care of you if he's called you to do anything. Let's go on. So verse 5 said, So Elijah did what the Lord told him. Did you hear that? Elijah was a well-raised child. Teenagers, did you hear that? So Elijah did what the Lord had told him. Parents, you owe me five bucks at the door for that. I just yelled at your kids, okay? Elijah did what the Lord told him to do. That's a well-raised child. What an amazing thing to be said about you, that you do what the Lord tells you to do. What a good God we serve. Now go on to chapter 18, verses 1 and 2. Look at we're almost done. Chapter 18, verses 1 and 2. Uh, after a long time. Say, after a long time. Okay, if you're not convinced, John Nink, I can hear you plain as day. You've got to be louder and more passionate. After a long time. Say it. After a long time. Oh, nice. Now you sound like you're just being cocky. Okay. <laughs> after a long time in the third year. Check it out. After, this is chapter 18, verses 1 and 2. After a long time in the third year. Uh, that means three years it's been in a drought. Three years the nation of Israel uh, has been in trouble. If you were to ask an Israelite at this time, uh, what's happening in you? The Israelites would have said to you, uh, we're struggling physically. We can't eat. I mean, when there's no water, you can't grow crops. We're struggling financially. I mean, if there's no rain, we, we got no crops to feed our cattle and we can't sell our cattle or our sheep. We're struggling because uh, we're struggling emotionally. It, it hurts us that, that God would turn his back on us and cause a drought to come. We're, we're hurting. We're struggling spiritually. And, and I bet you if you were an Israelite at that time, you would have said, where is God? God, where have you gone? Why, why am I in this situation? I wonder if you've ever asked the same question. I wonder if you've ever asked, where is God? Where is God? If I were there, I would have turned to the Israelite who asked that question, where is God? And I would have said to them, what have you done with God? Because that's the real question. What have you done with God? What shelf did you put God on? What back burner did you move God to? See, because the issue is not that God left them. Because God will never leave you nor forsake you. Did you hear me? God will never leave you nor forsake you. If you don't know where God is, it isn't that he left you. I just wonder where you left him. Where did you go that God did not call you to go to? See, for the children of Israel, for whatever reason, they, they shelved God and they chose other gods. And I'll show it to you because it says, it says, after a long time in the third year, the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Does that sound familiar? Have we heard that line before? Uh, it says, verse uh, 2 or second part of verse 1, go and present yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the land. So Elijah went to present himself to Ahab. Now, uh, let's just pick the middle part out here of verse 1. 
Go and present yourself to Ahab. After three years of a drought, Ahab has not only wanted the warrant for Elijah's arrest, he has said, bring me the head of Elijah. I want Elijah dead. Ahab and Elijah are not uh, friends on Facebook, okay? They're not tweeting back and forth. There's no blog sharing here. Uh, the, the reality is Ahab wants Elijah dead. And then God says, hey, Elijah, um, go and present yourself to Ahab. Go see him now. When you really got him ticked off, I want you to go see him. Now, here, here's the I want to answer this for you. Ahab uh, is not the problem. It's really his wife, which is usually the case in any relationship. <laughs> Some brave men who will be single tonight. Uh, is it back roll the balcony? He's like, amen, brother. It's usually the wife. Am I right? I mean, the last decision Eli uh, Ahab ever made for himself is when he stood at the altar and said, I do. That's the last time he made his own mind up. No, nobody says amen now. Here's what's funny is the women hate me and the men fear what will happen when they get home. We will not have an overcrowding issue next Sunday. Okay, so Jezebel, Ahab's wife, was a wicked woman, man. This woman wanted the head of Elijah. So he says, go present yourself. But I want you to see something before we move on and close. Verse 1 says, the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Verse 2 says, so Elijah went. The word of God came, so Elijah went. The word of God came, so Elijah went. Five times in Scripture, you will find in reference to Elijah, you will find, it started in chapter 17 and it goes on, that the word of God would come to Elijah, and when it came to him, he went. There was a rhythm to the relationship he had with God. God spoke, he did. There was a cycle to his life. God spoke, he went. There was, there was a pattern that was established in this relationship. God spoke, he went. I wonder what your pattern is. I wonder what your cycle is. I wonder what your rhythm is. Is God speaking and do you go? Has God spoken to you through a song, through a message, through a good friend, through scripture? When you hear God's word of challenge, do you go? When you hear God's word of, uh, of correction, do you, do you do it? When you hear God's word of faith, do you go? Can it be said about you today? That when the word of God came to you, you went. See, I wonder if part of the problem for us is that we heard God a long time ago tell us what we needed to do, and we did not do it. Some of you are dating the wrong person, and God already told that to you. Somebody went into business with a partner, and you knew God said don't. Somebody borrowed money from someone and you knew you shouldn't have. That can all change, okay? That can all change. I'm not trying to depress you. I'm just calling it out the way God's given it to me. I wonder if God had told you to do something and you did not do it. And that's why you're where you're at. I got good news for you. Jesus is coming. I got good news for you. Elijah's coming and he's got a question for you. So let's go on. Chapter 18, verses 17 through 19. This will get better for you if you're feeling any pain. Is everybody okay? Are you okay? Okay, I keep going. Okay, good. I got one person who believes in me. Clap. Two. I got two. Can I get three? Can a brother get a three? Okay, good. Don't encourage me, seriously. Do not encourage me. Verse 17 of chapter 18. When Ahab saw Elijah, so now they get to see each other, right? Ahab's been waiting for Elijah. This is verse 17. When Ahab saw Elijah, he said to him, Is that you, you troubler of Israel? Now, that is, that's kind of a, a different way to speak. But what's basically happening is Ahab is calling Elijah a name. He's saying, Is that you, you troublemaker? You have caused me great pain. I mean, the Bible can't write in superlatives, okay? The Bible can't write down what he called him, okay? But Ahab don't like Elijah, all right? I'm just cutting to the chase. And so he called him a troublemaker. Have you ever been called a name? I mean, has anybody ever called you a name? Don't tell us what it is, but I mean, has anybody ever called you a name? I mean, people have called me names for years. And people don't know me, they call me names. When I was a kid in elementary school, they called me spastic, okay? It, <laughs> I was born before Ritalin and Adderall, okay? And my mom would beat me before I'd leave for school and beat me when I got home, but she couldn't do anything between those hours while I was at school. It was free. He with the sun set free is free indeed. I didn't even know that verse. But anyways, I, I was spastic as a child. I was a little ADD, a little wired. And so in, in elementary school, I was spastic. And then I got to high school, they said I was out of control. Come on. Can't we all have a good time here? 
And then when I got to Bible college, because God called me to be a pastor, when I got to Bible college in my sophomore year, I failed homiletics class. Now, if you're not familiar with the big woofy woofy words, homiletics is, is when they teach you how to preach. And I failed that in my sophomore year. And I didn't understand why I failed it. And so I went to the professor when it was over. I said, how could I fail this class? And he said, John, he said, you are, I can describe you in three words. You are frantic. He said, you are distracting and you're emotional. And I'm like, wow, wow, I, I, I kind of saw myself as, as you know, uh, energetic and creative and passionate. But I see where you're coming from. I mean, I mean he, he thought I was frantic. What's frantic about me? I don't understand that. I'm not, I'm not distracting. I don't do stuff that's crazy. And I'm, by no means am I emotional. You know, and so, so he failed. And I said, is that what you failed? He goes, no, I failed you. He said, because there's no room uh, uh, in preaching for humor. You, you, there, nobody needs a funny man. And I'm like, oh. You didn't like my joke, man? Because yeah, my exam was a 10-minute exam. I had to preach on, on the Lord will be with you from, from uh, when Mary was told that she would be highly favored and she'd be with child and the Lord will be with you. And so I, I had 10 minutes and to preach a sermon on that. And I, and I want to start with a joke, loosen the people up. And so I told the joke. He didn't think it was funny. Did, did you want to hear the joke I told? I mean, this is like 30 years ago, but I remember it because that's good. So here it is. And you, you can use this. I, and I told this joke, and this is why I failed homiletics. I told about a little boy who had a little red wagon. And he was pulling his wagon through the woods, and he, and he went through a mud puddle. And he got his wagon stuck in the mud puddle. And he began to tug and pull on his wagon. He couldn't pull it out. And he began to curse a blue streak. Maybe that's what he was upset about. <laughs> Anyways, he began to curse a blue streak. And, and, and as he did, a priest came along. And a priest says, my child, you cannot speak that way. For God can hear you. He is everywhere. To which the little boy said, oh, really? He said, is God behind that tree? And the priest said, yes, God is everywhere. He's behind the tree. The little boy said, is he behind that rock? And the priest said, yes, God is everywhere. He's behind that rock. The little boy said, is he in my wagon? And the priest said, yes. To which the little boy said, can you tell him to get his butt out and help push? <laughs> what is wrong with that? By the way, if you're confused where we're at, so am I, but I'll catch up in a minute. <laughs> so I said, I said, so I'm frantic, distracting, and emotional, and now you don't like my joke. Was there anything else I did? And he said, yes. He said, you did not honor the desk of God. And I'm going to tell you right, I didn't grow up in church, but I'd never heard the phrase, honor the desk of God. I said, what is that? He said, John, in, in, in most churches, they have a pulpit, right? They have that big wooden thing up in the front of the church. He said, that's called the desk of God, and you must stay in contact with it at all times. You must always have a hand on it, for your power comes from the pulpit, the desk. Stay with me, little one. And so, so I will free them of this soon. And uh, I, I, uh, I said, okay. So second semester came, and I was to take homiletics again. By the way, I took it three times. But I took it the second. I don't have time to explain to you. But the second time I took homiletics, I got to my final exam, and I had my 10 minutes to preach. And I knew, don't be funny. Just lay it on them. And so I laid it on them. And, and so I'm preaching. I knew that if I moved to the side, I had to stay in contact with the desk of God, at least a finger touching all the time. And I moved over here to the left, and I kept my hand on it. And then one moment, I got whatever distracting is, he says, and I got way away from the desk of God, and I couldn't reach it. And I, and I saw his face, and I knew I was disappointing him, which meant I'm coming back. And, and then so all I did is I just put my foot out, and I kept going. I, true story. True story. I... I'm staying in contact with the desk of God. That's... So the third time I took homiletics, I didn't do any of that stuff. Here's the deal. I'm going to say this to somebody. I'll move on. We'll be almost done. I'm going to say this to somebody. Somebody here this morning has been called a name. Somebody's called you something. Elijah was called troublemaker. Somebody's called you something, and it ain't who you are. God made you more than what they think you are. They don't know what God has in you. Listen, I don't believe you came this morning because I'm stuck behind a pulpit. I believe you came because there is a spastic, out of control, frantic, uh, distracting, emotional individual who was willing to share with you what God's Word says. I think that's why you came. Am I not right? So for all the business of what somebody's called you, do not believe them. They don't know you. And then i got to finish up. Man, wow. Okay, here it is. Verse 18. <laughs> you, can you imagine what's going through my mind? Verse 18. Uh, Michigan won last night. Woo okay. <laughs> my mom used to do that. You know what that meant? Stay with me. 
Verse 18, I have not made trouble. This is, this is Elijah. You talk about a bold, audacious guy. Elijah's talking to the king of Israel who can kill him. Three years of a drought. Elijah looks him in the eye and says, I have not caused trouble for Israel, but you and your father's family have. Wow. You talk about putting it right in his face. He's like, it ain't me, it's your mom, man. That's what, a, that's what Elijah's saying. He didn't say your mom wears army boots, but he definitely was, he was right in his face. And, and I'm going to say to you right now, sometimes when you tell the truth, it's going to get you in trouble. Did you hear me? Sometimes when you tell the truth, it's going to get you in trouble. But if God called you to do it, are you going to step up to it? Or are you going to shy away from it? Did, did, did you remember I told you about that? Maybe that's why you're where you're at today. You did not do what God called you to do. It's time to step up and do what God calls you to do. He does it. He says, but it's you and your father's family. Stay with me. You have abandoned. Whew, wow. He doesn't let up at all. You have abandoned the Lord's commands and have followed the Baals. The Baals are the gods of the region. I'll talk about them in a second. You have abandoned the Lord's commands. It isn't that God left you, you left God, he's saying. God will never leave you nor forsake you. He was always with you. But you abandoned him. You walked away from him. You shelved him. You said, I got some better options. That's what Elijah says. And, and I wonder if that's, if that's not a picture of you and I at times. I wonder if, 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 again, part of why you're where you're at right now today is you abandoned God. You walked away. But guess what? All you got to do is turn around and He's right there for you. Right he's right there. God, is, God has never left you nor forsaken you, which means He's intimate with you. You, you might have walked away. You might have abandoned Him. But I'm telling you, He's, stay, he's staying right in step with you. Because that's what a father who loves you will do. Listen, it, it's his love that, that held him to the cross. It wasn't the wood. It wasn't the nails. It wasn't the soldiers. It was his love that held him to the cross. It was his love that, that moved the stone. It was his love that brought him back from the dead. It was his love that, that, that was the reason why he died and rose from the dead. Because he loves us. Listen, he would never leave you nor forsake you. But if you left him, turn around, turn around, turn around, turn around, turn around. Today's your day. Embrace Jesus because he loves you. So here, let me give you my last fantasy world here and then I'll finish on. Uh, I, I always have this fantasy of someday I want to produce movies. I don't even own a camera, but I got it. But I want to produce movies. And the first one, I'm going to do a, a, a movie on Beniah. Remember, he, he went into a, uh, into a pit on a snowy day and fought a lion. I did that a couple years ago. This will be my second movie, okay? This will be my, my second one because it's an epic showdown. Look at verse 19. Elijah says, now summon the people from all over Israel. Get them all here, he says. Bring every child of this nation and bring them where and have them meet me on Mount Carmel. You know, Mount Carmel was a thousand feet above sea level and the top of it was a plain that was 24 miles by five miles wide. That means they could have all fit there. Listen, God won't ask you to do something you can't be done. He said, meet me on Mount Carmel and bring and bring and bring, bring them boys with you. Bring the 450 prophets of Baal and bring the 400 prophets of Asherah. What he was saying was, I want to stack the odds against myself and against God. Uh, 850 to 1. 850 prophets versus Elijah. Listen, you don't show up to a fight unless you know who you got on your side. He didn't need anybody else. To the physical eye, it was Elijah. To the physical eye, it was 850 prophets of the devil. And it didn't matter because Elijah knew God was with him. God was on his side. Listen, I wonder if God didn't want you to know today that you may have very well stacked the odds against yourself. You may have very well stacked the odds against yourself like Elijah did. And God wants you to know today that even though the odds are stacked against you, if he's with you, ain't no foe that can stand against you. I mean, God is with you today. You just got to know what's going on. You got to just know who you brought to the fight. But I like Elijah. He brought the fight to their backyard. He brought the fight to them. He lost home field advantage. He said, I'm coming in here, boys, and I'm going to face you off. And I'll talk about that next week. But, but let, me, let me finish up real quick. I want you to know that the prophets of Baal worshiped the God of fertility, and, 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 and the prophets of Asherah worship the gods of agriculture. And you'll see how this works out for you, okay? Asherah, agriculture, Baal, fertility, having babies. So here it is. First uh, um, Kings 18, verse 21, and I'm done. Elijah went before the people and said, How long will you waver between two opinions? It's either God or the devil, he said. If it's the Lord who is God, then follow him today. But if it's Baal, then follow him. And, and here's what this, uh, confuses me and disgusts me is the last four words, which I'll talk about next week. The people said nothing. The people said nothing. Those five words 
uh, uh, confuse me. How can you not say anything when it's the God who created you and you've rejected him? But, but let's just answer the question, okay? Stay on track. How long will you waver between two opinions? Elijah is laying it down. He's saying, listen, one question. You answer it, we're out of here. How long will you waver? The word waver in the original language means to hop from branch to branch. It means to bounce around. It means to be unstable, unbalanced, to hop, to hop from here, to hop to there. It's this hopping motion. And in reality, um, he wanted them to know, you're hopping between gods. Because see, the children of Israel, when they arrived in the promised land, there were people in that region. And God said in Exodus 23, that you're going to meet other people. Don't worship their gods. Don't bow down to their gods. Don't sacrifice their gods because they will be a snare to you. Follow me and me alone. But the people got there. I really believe that the children of Israel love God. I really believe they love him as the one true God. But when they got there, they, they were shepherds. They, they weren't farmers. And so they, they, they didn't know how to till the land. And so the people of the region walked up to him and said, hey, Notice you're not able to, to get any, any, any produce from your, from your crops. Do you know in this region, we worship a God called Asherah. Uh, and, and he's the God of agriculture. He brings sun and rain and fertilization. And you need him if you want to be successful. To which the children of Israel said, no, 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 no. No, no, no that, that, we can't do that, man. We got the one true God. To which they probably said, hey, we're not saying dump the God you got. We're just saying add to him one more God. I mean, aren't two gods better than one? To which the children of Israel would pick up another God. And then when they were trying to conceive and have children, there was difficulties in, in, in conception. They, they would have the people of the region come to them and say, listen, we serve a God named Baal. He's a God of fertility and conception and childbirth. You're going to need him for the womb to be warm, to, 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 to get impregnated. And so you're going to need this. And so the children of Israel said, well, no, no, no. We have one true God and we've already taken on this other one here. But but, but they would say to them, but hey, listen, if two gods are better than one, then three gods got to be better than one. And so the children of Israel began to add to themselves other gods, basically putting it this way. When they needed God for something, they went over here, the one true God. But if they needed something for agriculture, they hopped over here to this branch, and now they got uh, the God of Asherah. And then, then this is where they go to for planting. And then they hop back to God for this. And then they hop over to the next branch for, for the God of Baal when it comes to fertility. So I know what you're thinking today. John, we, we don't do that. I mean, we don't, we don't do that. I mean, there's, uh, we don't worship other gods. We believe in the one true God. If I ask you today, you'd all probably raise your hand. We believe in God. Jehovah God. One God. The Son. Jesus. The Father and the Holy Spirit. We believe in one. But I bet you any money there is another God in competition with the one true God in your life. And it's not Baal, and it's not Asherah. It's you. It's me. See, because the greatest competition for God being the one true God and only God in my life is me. Amen. Yeah, it's me. Yeah, we ought to applaud God because I, it, it, and I know truth isn't always easy to applaud, is it? But we applaud it not because we approve it. We applaud it because it's right. See, the greatest competition to God in my life is me. And, and the lesson I've been learning over the last six weeks as I've been studying this is that I'm allowing myself to make decisions. See, because I'm, I'm going to say a couple things and I'll wrap up. God did not bring the children of Israel out of the land of slavery in Egypt to bring them in to the promised land to become slaves again. God does not want to do that. He's not willing that any should perish. And so he's going to fight for you. But let me say this also, that, that, that God refuses to compete for control of your life. He refuses to compete for control of your life. He already says to you, I created you. You are mine. There is no competition. Why are we even having this discussion? But he has to have the discussion because the children of Israel began to worship other gods, just like us beginning to worship ourselves and you would never see it you would never say that's true but let me walk you down the road because because when you don't trust the one true god the reason why you trust yourself or other things is because one you don't believe or trust that god uh, can handle everything in your life or two you don't believe that god is qualified to take care of your needs that's what happens and, and it looks like this you'll trust god that he is the creator of the world and everything in it but you don't trust him to help you with your business and the running of that you trust God over here for the forgiveness of your sins, right? You need him for the forgiveness of your sins. But over here you hop and you won't forgive your mother for the sins that she's done against you. 
Am I, am I pressing into anybody? Over here, we believe in the one true God who we know authenticates love and is love. But over here, we hop from bed to bed in relationship to relationship looking for false love. Over here, we hop because we need God because we believe that, that, that He is the one who increases our faith. But over here, we hop because we live with fear in our lives. Over here, we hop. We know that God is the one who gives us happiness and joy, yet we live with bitterness in areas of our life. Am I touching home yet with anybody yet? Have I got you yet? Because the reality is, that's what's happening. We're hopping back and forth. We're wavering. And Elijah says, how long will you waver? How long will you allow what the headlines say to mean more than what the Word of God says? How long will you allow what somebody on the internet says than what, what the Word of God says? How long will you allow the newest fad to move you than what the Word of God says? Listen, our God heals, our God restores, our God delivers, and our God sets free. What's the question? And you guys better come. Listen, I'm, 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 I, I know I got a little frantic there on you. Got a little emotional and distracting. But I want you to know that our God wants you to make a decision today. How long are you going to waver? How long are you going to trust your opinions? How long are you going to trust on what you think is the best way to handle your life? Why not trust God and God alone? Growing up, my mama, um, anywhere she went, carried her purse. Mamas, you got a purse on you today? Mamas, be proud. Raise your hand. You got a purse on you? Mamas, yeah, you got a purse on you. What I was always amazed about, Andy, was that wherever my mama went, she had a purse. And whatever you needed, mama had in her purse. When you fall down, skin your knee, mama had a Band-Aid. Pull right out. You, got, you wanted something sweet? My mama had hard candy, rock candy, bubble gum. She had it in her purse. You needed a half inch, a 10 millimeter socket, a Phillips, a regular screwdriver. I'm telling you, my mama had it in her purse. You need a safety pin, a clothes pin, a hair pin, a cotter pin. My mama had it in her purse. My mom had a can of WD-40 one time in her purse. I do not know what she was doing, but it was in her purse. One time I found in my mom's purse a, a knife. And we had like a six inch blade on it. And I said to my mom, I said, what do you need a knife for? And my mom says, what are you asking for? I don't know if my mom was gang related or what, but what I do know is this, you needed something, she had it. You didn't have to go anywhere else. She had it. I'm here to tell you today, folks, you need anything. God's got it. God's got it for you. How long are you going to waver? He's got it. I know this about my God. Why don't you stand on your feet? I, I know this about my God. My God still does miracles. My God uh, defeated the grave. My God not only restores, but he heals and, and he sets free. My God walks on waters and makes crooked paths straight. My God uh, delivers his people from bondage. He, he heals the broken and he, he can fix what's missing in your life. My God is the God who says, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. He wants you to know that. And my God says that the greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. God wants you to know today that he's the one and true God. Joshua laid it down to the children of Israel later on after Elijah said, hey, tell me this day whom you're going to serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It's done. It's finished. Thank you for joining us at Westside Community Church. We hope to see you next Sunday at our 9 or 11 a.m. service.